Today, we're gonna to go through some HVAC systems. We're gonna give you a nice introduction, and then we'll tell you about Belzona solutions for condensers, cooling water towers, chillers, and air handling systems. And then we'll go right into our question and answer section. My name is Aria Chambers. I'm the marketing specialist for Banks Industrial Group. I'll be your moderator for today. And with me, I have AJ Patel, who's our business development manager, and Mark Borski, who's our technical manager. With that, I'm gonna pass it over to AJ to get us started. Awesome, well, thank you so much, Aria. And good afternoon to everybody. I hope everybody is doing well. Uh, it's kind of ironic. We're gonna talk about heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. Um, and this is going to happen on what is a very, very cold Thursday afternoon. So I think it dipped below freezing last night, and but it's supposed to warm up. Uh, so it's actually why it is a great time of year to have this conversation because when things get cold, um, it's an opportunity to help us uh, repair our air conditioning system. So HVAC, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. So, um, you know, as Ari mentioned, we're going to go over a few components. And I wanted to just take a moment, give you a very big macro overview of what it is that we're going to be discussing today, some of the elements we're going to dive into. So. First, how does an HVAC system work? And again, this is gonna be very high level. Uh, as you'll see later in the presentation, we'll get a little bit more detailed, but I don't wanna kinda of scum up the message here. So first we have an air handling system. So basically, uh, this is the system that pulls in the air from your building, which is meant to keep your employees comfortable or maybe whatever equipment you have at a proper temperature. After all, this is what it services. So the air handling unit is going to pull air from there. It's going to go over these exchanger um, coils right here, and it's going to cool it down in the case of an air conditioner. Um, and this fan here will then blow it back into the um, into the building. Actually, it goes reverse. It gets sucked in by the fan, blown across the coil, then out to the building. Excuse me. And that is basically what happens. So the question is, how do these coils? Uh, get cool. Well, it's because of a chilled water system. Uh, and what happens is this chilled water system has cold water that crosses against a, uh, a refrigerant. It sucks the heat out and it cools down that refrigerant and it sends it to these coils, which then makes the air cold. So then the question is, well, what happens to the water? How does that chill the refrigerant? Well, that is part of a uh, condenser water system, also known as a cooling tower. Um, you often see these on the top of buildings, but basically it takes the, the, chilled, the, the water and it basically sucks all the heat out of it through these big powerful fans. Uh, you'll often see this if you're driving through a city. Um, you'll see buildings will have what looks like plumes of steam coming out and actually what they are is the condenser water systems or the cooling tower systems. So this system actually can also be used to heat a building. Uh, instead of having the condenser water system and the chilled water system, you'd simply take those out and replace it with a boiler system that would create steam. And essentially that would lead to the heating of these coils. And that is how you make an heating system. So why do we care about erosion and corrosion in HVAC systems? Why is this important? Well, first of all, again, as I mentioned earlier, the point of these systems is to keep you know, the buildings that you're working in comfortable. You want to be able to utilize them. You want your employees that go there to be able to be comfortable while they're there, and it creates a good work environment. Um, but what happens is if you don't properly maintain them and if you don't stay ahead of them, you can run into some problems. So one of them is reduced operating efficiency. As these units are used over and over again, obviously you have elements like water and metal involved. Guess what? That's going to create a corrosive environment. And so as the equipment starts to degrade, it has to run longer. So your efficiencies start going away because your heat exchanges aren't as good. And because of that, you then have to run the equipment longer, which means your operating costs are gonna go up. But also what happens is because you're running it longer, you're actually going to shorten the equipment life because the actual runtime is going to extend longer than it needs to. And therefore you're gonna bring it in, bring in its total lifespan potentially by years. And ultimately, this equipment is very expensive to replace. Uh, you know, HVAC systems are not the thermostat on the wall. That's an easy thing to replace. They're very large pieces of equipment, often found in the core of a building or at the top of the building or below the building, never in a convenient place where you could simply go in, pop out old units, put in new units. There's usually a decent amount of logistics that's going to be involved. 
potentially cranes, potentially opening up sides of buildings. So your goal when it comes to your HVAC system is to stay ahead of it in maintenance and make sure that you prolong its life as long as you can. So what are some of the common issues that we can see? So with cooling water towers, again, I mentioned you have a lot of water and that water is moved around in pipes and those pipes are metal. So you, put, you, you often see issues with some of the pipe work associated with it. You might have leaks and once those leaks start happening, again, you're pulling away your, cool, your, your big element that you're moving around, which is the water, you're reducing the efficiency and again, costs go up. Uh, also, water just spraying around is a problem in general. You don't really want to have that in your buildings. Uh, cooling tower basins. So what happens is, is that the water goes in, heat is extracted up, water falls to the bottom. Again, you have a galvan You might have metal. It might be galvanic. But again, over time, this starts to wear away. You start seeing corrosion. And once that corrosion happens, you can potentially have leaks. Um, so zooming in and looking in closer, when we talked about the fans themselves, uh, there are massive fans that rotate, and what they do is they suck air out, <clears throat> and that what they're sucking out is the heat and the energy. But what comes along with that? You're going to get small droplets of water. So you're going to droplets of water, droplets. Uh, you're going to get small debris. You know, all kinds of things that are going to flow through there. You might have some of the the metal that's corroded away, and as the leading edge of that fan blade is moving forward, what's going to happen, as you can see here, is it starts getting busted up because it's constantly having these collisions as it's rotating around and around and around. And so a few things happen. One, the ability for that blade to move through the air smoothly and lift out the heat, that becomes less efficient because its curve, its shape is going away. And so when that happens, the motor itself has to run harder. You're going to use more energy. You're going to use more electricity. But in addition to that, it can lead to earlier fa uh, failure because guess what? you're breaking the leading edge apart and eventually it's going to work its way through the fan blade and you're going to end up having a bigger failure. So that's one area that we see huge opportunities um, to potentially get ahead of problems. I mentioned earlier, we're moving a lot of water. Well, when you want to move a liquid, what do you use? You use a pump. And so oftentimes what happens is these units start working harder and harder over time. Um, they may be pushed to capacity. You might start seeing vibrations happen within the pumps themselves. When pumps start to vibrate, unfortunately, their, sh their shafts uh, tend to get scored. Uh, they tend to get beaten up. Um, what happens then is, is that water starts leaking out or some kind of fluid starts leaking out and you can have potential problems there and you lose efficiency. Ultimately, you lose the lifetime of your equipment and your money. Chiller systems, uh, as we look closer there, um, they're generally made of like a copper alloy on the top tube side. Uh, carbon steel on the, on the tube sheet side. Um, what we call the tube sheet is basically uh, this area here. So you can see kind of the silver metal, that's the carbon steel, and then all these round tubes, those are generally made of copper. Uh, it's also important to note that they, they're not welded in. Uh, what they do is, is they put the tube in and then they put some equipment in there and they actually just squeeze it out. So we call that rolling, we roll the tubes in. And so what happens over time is you get a corrosion effect where um, because you have two dissimilar metals, um, you're gonna get some kind of galvanic, you're gonna get a, a, corro a corrosion is actually a chemical um, reaction. So that reaction happens across two dissimilar metals when there's water present and you start eating away at the tube sheet and guess what happens? Water starts passing through this area because now you're past the area that you would have rolled, right? So now you got water passing through, now you've lost efficiency in your heat exchange, now your equipment has to run longer. And again, it's the same line. We're all headed towards one thing, which is you're going to have to replace your equipment earlier, and that could be a huge cost. Finally, when we get to air handling units, we're talking about duct work. We're talking about failures on the insulation itself. Underneath the insulation, you can see lots of corrosion. Joints um, are another area. And, and the fact of the matter is, is that there are a lot of wonderful solutions here too. In fact, one solution that we have in mind is going to be the topic of another webinar that we're going to do early in 2021. I'll give you a little hint. It's called Technodoc. And that is an encapsulating system that will absolutely change uh, the way that you look at ductwork and its needed maintenance and actually the energy efficiencies within your building. So if you have questions, if you have duct issues today, if this is something that is of concern to you, uh, you can reach out to myself or Mark. Our emails are at the bottom.
go ahead and write them down and we'll be more than happy to uh, talk to you about it. But until then, we'll be, uh, we'll be doing a webinar in the next year. So with that said, I'm going to turn it over to my partner here, Mark Borsky. Um, he is our technical manager here at Belzona Repair Technology and Banks Industrial Group. He'll be able to go into detail around um, the various uh, projects that we've done over time. He'll be able to talk to you a little bit about some of the challenges that he's faced and dive a little bit more into uh, some of the some of the ways that we we corrected some of these issues. So, Mark, let me go ahead and pass it on to you. Take it away, my friend. Uh, microphone on. Thanks, AJ. Uh, let me pop my my side of the presentation on here, and we'll get going. All right. Thanks, AJ, and thank you everybody for being here um, today. So. When I first started getting ready for this uh, this the webinar, the first webinar that we did, which was back in March, that was our first COVID era webinar. Um, I never really thought that we'd be here mid November, um, still doing webinars under the same under the same uh, pandemic situation that we're in. So I really appreciate you guys being here, um, and I hope we can and give you guys some really good information. So, all right, when I started first looking at um, compiling some case histories for for this webinar, I kind of was a, thought it would be an easy task because this, you know, HVA systems, you know, as AJ just went through them, they're they're pretty straightforward. There's just a few major pieces of, of equipment that come together. Um, but when you start to really dive down to all the little bits and pieces, and you know the different problems you have, there's really a lot uh, a lot of stuff that that needs to be maintained, needs to be repaired, and needs to be protected, which is you know, the Belzonas, you know, basically the Belzonas slogan. So um, I'm going to run through more of uh, the application side. I'm going to cover some of the stuff AJ already covered, um, but I'm going to try and stay out of that, the, the technical workings of the HVAC system. So starting start with this. This is a pretty cool picture. This is actually in Philadelphia. Um, just wanted to highlight this. This is a, a job that we did here. We worked on these cooling towers uh, that are at basically the top of, of a skyscraper here in Philly. Um, it's a pretty neat job. And I actually have some pictures of the interior of those, those cooling towers later on. So Starting with cooling towers, it just seems like the logical place to start. Um, cooling towers can be on top of roofs. A lot of times they're on top of roofs just to save real estate. They can be on the ground, they could be in a parking lot, they could be next to the building. Um, but really, in, in, in large commercial buildings, they're going to be up on top of the roof. So AJ highlighted the number one problem that we see in cooling towers. They're 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 fairly simple pieces of equipment in that they're just basically a big box made out of sheet metal with fans in the top and then some piping that runs water through the top and, and drops it down. But in the bottom is a pan full of water. And like I said, it's 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 just it's just uh, galvanized sheet metal. So the galvanizing holds up for a while, but eventually the water finds its way in and starts to destroy the sheet metal. It doesn't take long for you to get deep pits that become holes in the sheet metal. And the biggest problem, obviously, is is leakage. You're losing water that you then have to put back in. You've got water all over your roof. Um, in the winter, you've got puddles that become ice. And eventually, it gets bad enough that you actually can't run your equipment because you can't move enough water through, through the tower. Here's some, and I'm going to say these are typical examples of what we find. Um, towers don't get the biggest maintenance budget. Um, they're really seen as a, as, a, as a cost until something goes wrong, and they tend to be really um, neglected. So by the time we're called in, it's usually at the point where the owner is, is looking at, do I replace my tower or do I fix my tower? And replacing them can be a monumental task. I mean, as AJ said, you've got to get cranes up on the roof. You know, you've got not just the tower itself, but the piping associated with it. So a good alternative to replacing a coin tower is is to repair it and to coat it, um, which is what we do here at Belzona. So here's an example of what a coin tower looks like inside. This is actually the coin tower that we looked at in the first picture. Um, as you can see, it's it's just a large metal box. Those 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 square areas are where the fans would go, and it's been cleaned up. Um, it had a failed coating on it. It was beginning to corrode. There were a lot of holes in it, and we went in. And the first thing that we do is we abrasive blast that we clean off all the junk. Then we need to patch all the holes. We use a Belzona composite material 
um, to patch those holes. Then once the holes have been patched and we need to seal the seams because the seams are really just, once again, it's just sheet metal that has just been bolted together with, 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 with tech screws or bolts. And then we come in and we, and we coat it. And we wanna coat it with something that's gonna last. So we use Bell's on a 5811, which is a two-part immersion grade epoxy. So by immersion grade, I mean, this is designed to be underwater or under a liquid for its entire life. And lifespan is, you know, 10 or 20 years even. So this is, this is a robust system and this is, is gonna make this tower last for a really long time. Here's a couple more examples. This is a different tower, just kind of a different configuration. This is kind of a good picture, as you can see here. Um, you can see, maybe a laser pointer for you guys. Um, up in this area, you can see the fan that would be above you uh, that's pulling the air, pulling the air up through the water, cooling it. Here's an example of seams being sealed with an elastomer. Here's another configuration. This is a different, different style tower um, than the other two. They, like I said, they come in a lot of different shapes and sizes but they all basically do the same thing. Next area of concern that I wanna talk about is the piping associated with the tower. So um, these towers are almost always outside. And so initially they're subject to regular weather conditions. And of course, piping that's outside, that paint has a, has a, has a lifespan. And in addition to that, that, that mist that was coming off the tower that the AJ was talking about. So you're, 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 you're pulling, water droplets up through and, and you'll see that plume of mist that gets up here in the air picks up all your pollutants and comes down and lays in these pipes these pipes are constantly in a wet environment but not just a wet environment but a wet acidic environment because they're if you've ever heard of acid rain they're pulling all that junk out of the air and it isn't long before the tops of those pipes starts to paint starts to go and then the pipes start to corrode and um start to look like that once again usually a very neglected uh, uh portion of a facility um, you know, you only have so much money to go around and, and we usually only get to these when they get to be really bad. So this is an example of uh, a cooling tower at, at a, a major university here in New Jersey um, that supplied the, the air conditioning to the dean's office. So this was a high priority for them to fix, um, make sure he had his air conditioning. I'll show you the next picture, a couple different things. So if the pipes are in good enough condition and they're still, they're still sound, we can go ahead and remove all that rust and corrosion, remove any failed coatings, and then install a good quality coating like a 5811 or one of our other um, two-part epoxy systems that is going to protect this pipe in the long term. Because once again, you got to look at this as a marine environment. This isn't just a normal pipe that's running down the side of the road. This is constantly seeing uh, that mist. Sometimes this pipe is so corroded away that it's not able to do its job anymore and you're at risk of it, of it a holing out. So one option is to cut it out and replace it, but that's not always feasible. In this case, they couldn't shut this down and replace that pipe and there's a big cost to that. So this is an example of our carbon fiber super wrap material that we use. It's an ASME approved material. We use it not just in facilities, but we use it in industrial locations on washer oil rigs, in nuclear power plants, and this is as good as replacing the pipe. This is a 20 year repair um, that can be done without having to shut this line down. You're gonna see a lot of that in this presentation because it's very useful in HVHC. Here's another example. This one is a, a pipe that actually leaked. Um, we had to stop that leak because they couldn't turn this off and install the, uh, the repair to it. And then the pipe that was good, of course, we coated that to protect that. This is a riser. Um, this is an industrial facility, but you can have these at, at a, a uh, larger facility if you had if you had your cooling towers outside. You always have a riser though. This is bringing the water to the top of the tower. And this is this is the warmer water that's coming back in the system. So it's very, very susceptible to corrosion. So piping and cooling towers not always made of carbon steel. Sometimes it's made of fiberglass. Well, obviously fiberglass isn't going to rust, but fiberglass has its own issues. So when fiberglass starts to get older and the paint that was first applied to it starts to wear away, the fibers in the fiberglass begin to be exposed to UV and the UV will break down that fiberglass and it will embrittle it. And eventually those fiberglass pipes will crack and break and, and fail and have to be replaced. Very simple to keep them up and running and that's just to, to give them a good coating. So this is an example of a, a Belzona um, material. This is Belzona 5111 which is a urethane, this is a UV stable urethane that will protect these pipes for 
for for 10 plus years um, without without having any risk that the fiberglass is going to degrade. All right, so while we're basically back up on the roof, I want to move over to the air handlers. And AJ talked about how the air handlers worked and um, talked a little bit about ductwork related to it. What I want to focus on is this area here. As you can see, there's a fan there. So that fan is driven by an electric motor. And um, oh, just real quick, here's a couple examples of uh, cooling towers. They come in different shapes and sizes. So, and this, if, you, if your stairs don't look like this, call Banks Industrial, they'll help you out. Um, so inside the air handler, here's an example of that, the, the shaft that connects the motor to the fan. And here's that scroll cage motor that we saw on the other one. So these are up on the roof. Nobody's checking on these every hour, probably not every day, probably not every week. And these, these bearings have a tendency to seize up. And when they seize up, that fan, it just keeps spinning and spinning and spinning and spinning and spinning until somebody hears a, a vibration or a noise or happens to check on it. And then this is what you found. It doesn't take very long to wear the shaft down like that. Now, one option obviously is to replace the shaft, but that's not the easiest job in the world. These shafts are, are, are stuck in here and sometimes they need to be cut out in pieces. Um, so it's a very difficult and time consuming operation. So Belzona has a very tried and true proven method for repairing these shafts in place without taking the equipment apart. All you have to do is remove the bearing and we go in and we create a former. Now this former can be made out of metal or we now have the ability to 3D print these and have them just shipped right to you. Or we can come out and do the application if you need. But it's a very, very simple application. This former gets a release agent on it, which is basically a wax so that the Belzona won't stick to it. Then the shaft area that was worn, we abrade this area in here. And then we put the clamshell former on top. We put it together and we let it cure. So basically anybody that's ever played with Play-Doh when they were a kid can make this repair. So once the bell zone is cured, which only takes a couple hours, we break this, this clamp off and we are left with a brand new shaft area that we can slide our bearing onto. Go right back in service. All right, so now we're done on the roof. Let's move down to the mechanical room. So I've been in lots and lots and lots and lots of mechanical rooms. Sometimes they're up in the penthouse of a, of a building. A lot of times they're in the basement and they are not normally like this. I've been in a few that are like this, that are pristine, where you can eat up the floor. And I've been a lot, they were super dingy, dirty, and scary in some old buildings. And most of them are in between, but they all have one common thing in, in place. They're, they're full of equipment. They've got pumps, they've got chillers, they've got uh, boilers, uh, they've got valves, they've got piping everywhere. And they're usually very hot, and very humid and moist and dirty, which is kind of odd thinking that your air conditioning unit is in, in a place where it, get, it stays hot. And that's because they're, this machine's job is to make cold air. So you, it's conserving all the coldness it can, but it's giving off heat, like the back of your refrigerator gives off heat. If you ever notice your refrigerator is hot on the back, well, this room is hot because of that. So talk about the chillers. The chillers are, this is the heart of the system. Uh, I don't want to get too far into the details of, of how they work because we don't really have time for that today. But just suffice it to say, it's made up of two, uh, two heat exchangers, a condenser and an evaporator. And they, they, they mostly do the same thing. One takes the tower water uh, out of the tower, and the other one takes the, the water from the condenser and runs it through the evaporator and runs coolant through that. Um, and there's a lot of things going on here. So we've got the same kind of thing where we have water flowing through the tube sheet. So this is an example of a tube sheet. And AJ talked about this before. You can see here, this is what it looks like. This is before it was sandblasted. This was all the corrosion that's just loose corrosion on there. You take it off, you don't have a lot left. And once you lose this seal, you, you have a problem. So you can use Belzona. We can go ahead and, and, and make a repair to that. Here's another good example of that. Heat exchangers aren't always round. This is a square one. And this is actually a side by side. They're both next to each other. But once again, you can see how badly that was corroded. I mean, that was just, you know, on top of this corrosion causing that, this comes off and gets inside the tubes and clogs the tubes. And so you lose, you know, think about clogged arteries and you lose all the efficiency in there. And every year somebody's got to come in and clean them and all this junk comes out and you start losing tubes. So this is, a, this is what it looks like after it was coated. Give some more examples. Some more examples just of general, it's, you know, corroded, coated. So. This is a neat one. This is actually at a, a big university in Pennsylvania that has lots and lots and lots of these. 
Um, and this is a, is a very large heat exchanger, actually only goes through one side. But this was this is when back when we coded it back in 2005. And here we have it opened up back here in, in 2018. Um, it's dirty, but the coating's still intact. Um, it's still doing its job. They open this every single year and check it. Um, as you see, they have lost some tubes. The tubes start to degrade just on their own, but those are those plugs are, are where the tubes have been plugged. All right, so we'll talk about bell end. So on this last heat exchanger, this had a flat door sheet, not a bell end. But most of your other heat exchangers, the round ones, are gonna have this bell end. And on one side, you're gonna have a division plate, and the other side, you're not. And you're gonna have an inlet and an outlet. So where the water comes in, the water goes out, um, have to be separated by what they call a division plate. So here's an example of what they look like coded. But this is an example of a division plate. So this is sealed. This should be sealed to your tube sheet. If you go back and you look at your pictures of your tube sheets, you'll see, um, that was an example, but you'll see that there's a, a place where the division plate meets the that. So water comes in the inlet and goes out the inlet outlet, and it's supposed to go through the tubes before it goes out the outlet. Well, in this case, it goes right here and it goes right there. So the water, some of your water never goes to your tubes. So some of your water never goes, gets cooled. So in that case, you, you're losing tremendous efficiency. So these are these are sometimes difficult to replace. In this case, this is this is obviously an older model. Um, you may not have the casting available. It may take it may take months to get one of these to to fabricate it for you. So we can go in with Belzona and we can actually restore those those division plates and and make it actually better than brand new because the Belzona will never corrode. So um, this is an example of another issue that we we see a lot, and that's the ceiling surfaces, the gasket surface. You get what's called corrosion creep here, where the corrosion slides in here, and eventually your gasket won't seal. And you need to maintain pressure in these, in these, you know, it's not just leaking, a little bit of leaking on the floor. You, you need to maintain pressure or else you can't run the machines. So this is another example here. This was this was not an issue you see, but this is a really neat application in that this this was this was repaired in less than four hours. This this uh, this was a uh, a flange at an oil refinery that was actually had water in it, and um, was leaking, and they they used a, a special forming method to re, to replace it. Um, pretty neat application. So, all right, now I want to talk about the chilled water side, but I don't want to get into the the, the workings of the machine. Just suffice it to say that the can the Kenster side is where your tower water comes in, and this is generally warmer. And over here, you're starting to make cold cold refrigerant and then cold water and measure cold air this side these components over here they're cold and they're insulated so this is an example of an evaporator so this this side here you see this black insulation this is like a foam insulation that's glued on and and this is also the elbow here so i'm gonna talk about these a little bit what we've got going on here is we've got cold steel once again remember we're in a hot humid environment in that in that boiler room and you get moisture under here and you can't see it and over time Corrosion starts to happen there, and nobody knows it's happening until your machine's not working right, and all of a sudden you have a leak. And then you start talking your insulation off, and it looks like that. And you can see here, this, this came up because this, this area here, there was a leak that they had to, had to locate the leak because they were losing refrigerant, and they were, you know, the machine wasn't working properly. So um, it wasn't really feasible to replace this machine at the time. It was not in a place that they could really get to. Uh, it wasn't in their budget to replace it. Um, so we came in and used once again the bells on a carbon fiber and the carbon fiber at the bottom of it. This is the only problem, the area that they felt like they had a problem. So we went and did that and then subsequently it was reinsulated. And that's been in service. I was actually in that building. That's a that's a another school uh, down here in um, in southern New Jersey. And I was in that building uh, just the other week, and it's it's been a couple of years since we've done that, and it's working just fine. Um, this area here is adjacent to that. That's that's this is going between the evaporator and the compressor. And once again, this is this is colder and it's also insulated. And once again, a leak. They, there was a leak somewhere. They they were losing refrigerant and they didn't know where, so they started ripping insulation off and until they could find that leak, or in this case, leaks. And a lot of times it's in this area here where it's welded for some reason. So um, in this case, what we did is we removed all the corrosion and scale, and then we used a Belzona putty, an epoxy putty, to seal any leaks, to fill any pitting, any areas of concern, and um, before we wrapped it. And this is also interesting to, to note, this, is, this, this, this compressor, the machinery that's on either side of this pipe, is very delicate machinery, and you can't get any debris in there. So to take this off and replace it, 
not only is it you know you're, you're getting come alongs and chain falls and and you know getting getting it in and out and the new one on you've got to worry about getting debris inside the inner mechanics of your machine which you don't want to do uh, think about taking a cylinder head off an engine and getting something in your in one of your cylinders you don't want to do that so here's an example of it done this is what it looks like after it's finished and this is this is a permanent repair you'll never have to worry about this again um, over here is an example of, of, of it in progress. This is a consolidation film. This, this, we use this to squeeze out all the excess air and excess resin out of our repair. So this ends up being a real solid uh, permanent repair. All right, some machines have this and some done. This is called economizer. This is also so, so part of the same system. Um, it, it's in between, if you use it, it's in between the evaporator and condenser and it, it kind of pre-cools the coolant before it goes in if you think like a preheater for for a boiler system or whatnot um and these are these are made of very thin gauge metal um, they don't see a lot of pressure they see it maybe a, a pound or two of, of of vacuum so they made a, they're made of real thin metal and once again this is what you get when you take that insulation off and then you go through and, and you'll find little pinholes and that's where you're losing your, your refrigerant you're constantly losing refrigerant and 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 that makes the machine extremely inefficient and, and to the point where it doesn't work anymore. So we remove all the corrosion and then we go and use that same paste and we go ahead in any areas where they're, they're either we've identified holes or they're suspect, especially around the welds. Uh, we go ahead and fill that in and then we, then we install a wrap system. In this case, we use a, a, a fiberglass system that with a Belzona resin and a, we use a, a, a Belzona coating material called 5892. Um, and, and we, coat, we, we put it on as a primer coat, put the fiberglass on it, put a secondary coat, and once again, problem solved. All right, so not everything in, not everything in, the, in, the, in the mechanical room slash boiler room is cold. So um, buildings have to have heat too, and the heat is generally some sort of steam. And in this case, you have things that are associated with that steam that have the same kind of CUI problems, corrosion problems. This is an application that, that we highlighted uh, before also in one of our webinars, um, but we'd like to come back to because this, this was in the, in the sub-basement of a historic church and this, this couldn't be taken out. This is a condensate pot. This is where the condensate water comes back and sits and just sludge and rust just eventually ate the bottom of this out. Their only other option was to cut this in pieces and remove it and then bring a new tank in, in pieces and weld it in place, which wasn't a good option for them. So in this case, this had no access. We had, to, we had to cut this access door in it, and we found everything short of a dead body in here. It was, there was a lot in there. Cleaned it all out. We used, in this case, we used our wrap system internally to line this, to make a new floor for it, and then we coated the interior of it. And then we put the, the opening back on, and to avoid welding, we went ahead and just used the same carbon fiber system to put that patch back on, and that's up and running. Another condensate tank, another example of CUI. Didn't, you know, as you can see here, this metal jacketing from the outside, no problem. All of a sudden, stuff's come out the bottom. You take your insulation off, not good. Once again, simple solution for us. All right, so this is the last thing I wanna to highlight today. This is kind of a neat application. I've only actually done this once. Um, this, is a, uh, this is the head of, the bell end of an, of an exchanger um, that was actually outside. And this had water in it. And in the winter, they're supposed to drain the water out, um, but they didn't. So what happened was this froze and cracked. And they went to order a new head. And this they didn't realize it had cracked until summertime when they went to turn their air conditioning on. And lo and behold, no air conditioning. So they went out, they found the crack, ordered a new head. It was going to be six to eight weeks. So they couldn't wait six to eight weeks for their for their air conditioning. So we we patched all this up, ground it down, and basically built a brand new head internally for this head. And then we coated it with uh, Belzona 1341, which is our ceramic coating. And they went ahead and installed that. And a funny story about this is that they installed this, got the air conditioning up and work, working, and it was supposed to be a temporary repair. Their new head showed up. And they basically sent it back because this one was working fine and they didn't want to pay for the new head. Um, basically, that concludes my portion here. So just in summary, our HVA systems, systems are not just here to make us comfortable. They're here um, to make the interiors buildings, you know, you think about hospitals, schools, factories, um, 
warehouses, places that need to stay cool. So these are critical pieces of equipment that we need to maintain. Um, and if we maintain them and if we, if we, if we treat them properly, um, we can make them last for years and years and years. So with that, um, I'm gonna go ahead and back to Aria, who's gonna do our Q and A. All right, thank you so much, AJ and Mark, for a great presentation. To get us started in Q and A, um, AJ, we do have a question that asks, what is the best time of year to start inspecting your chiller systems? So I think I, I think I touched on that earlier, uh, but such a such a good question. Um, generally speaking, uh, once the weather starts turning, you're not going to see as much load on your chiller system because it's already kind of cold outside. So that's when we generally see people saying, hey, why don't you come out and take a look at our chiller system? So I'd say now, now is good. Uh, but um, generally speaking, uh, whenever you have large mechanical equipment, it is always good to be looking at it, monitoring it and watching it. But uh, if you have this equipment and you're, you're concerned, um, we, we are more than happy to come out uh, you can reach out to Mark or, Mark or I, uh, our emails are on the bottom here, and we will be more than happy to look at whatever, uh, whatever system you have and, and help you figure out how to make it last longer. Yeah, I'd, li I'd like to just tag something onto the end of that, um, kind of expand on that. There's one thing that you should always be inspecting your equipment, obviously, um, but these air conditioning, especially here in the Northeast, these, these, the air conditioning units come down in the fall and they go back up in the spring. Um, so what I like to address is the best time to make the repairs is in the fall and the winter, because what tends to happen is we tend to get a lot of calls for people that want to do work to their HV systems as we're getting into, into the middle of spring and it's starting to get warm and there's, there's a lot of demand right then. So, it, you know, you, and you're also up against a deadline to get that up and running. So if you can get if you can get it done the earlier the better um you'll you'll be ahead of the game you won't be fighting um everybody for scheduling um there's only you know, so much work that we can do the time of year great point thank you both for your answer and then we have one more question that came through regarding a cooling tower that has multiple up well, not multiple levels. My cooling tower is located at ground level with some underground piping. Could you suggest maintenance tips for this situation? Mark, you want to take that? Yeah, sure. That's a great. That's a great question. Um, so we we talked a lot about cooling towers being, being in different places. Sometimes cooling towers are located on the ground, and they may be across a parking lot, and the piping may may go underground under the parking lot and come up in the building somewhere. Um, and that piping is, is also susceptible to corrosion, primarily in what we call the, the soil to air interface, which is usually the, about the first two to three feet of the, of the buried piping. Um, that's something you should inspect um, because it um, has a tendency to corrode there and you can't see it because it's underground. And if you get to it early enough, it's a simple process, just like we showed before, um, to go ahead and, and either um, apply a good quality Immersion grade coating to that piping if 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 we get to it early enough, or if it's if it's too far gone, you can always use use the wrap system. But um, that's something we see quite often. This is our last webinar for the year. We will see you in 2020 and thank you for joining. Have a happy Thanksgiving and stay safe. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. <laughs>